AMD today releases the most powerful desktop processor the world has seen. It's called Ryzen Threadripper 2990WX, and it brings 32 cores and 64 threads to the table. In proper workloads, absolutely huge gains can be seen. Due to tight timing and a looming SIGGRAPH conference to attend, this video is going to be pretty abbreviated compared to the article version on the website. The focus here will be on me spitting out as many test results in as short a time as possible, as I have a 5am flight in the morning and have yet to pack. But what can I say? Benchmarking the 2990 is downright addicting. In total, 8 of the most relevant CPUs I could find have been tested in 5 PCs, and for the first time, we've been able to test all 5 of those PCs using the same memory configuration. That's 32GB of DDR4 3200G skill memory supporting 14 14 14 timings. To rattle off a couple of very important details before jumping into the performance, it's important to get the point across that the 2990WX is in no way meant as a gaming CPU. Its design and both its overall IPC isn't going to deliver the kind of gaming experience you'd see from a Ryzen 7 or Intel Core i7 series. There's a 16 core mode available, which does help the situation, but I haven't been able to test it out at this point. In gist, this processor and also the forthcoming 2970X are pure workstation CPUs, meant for those who need the aggregate performance of dozens of cores more than single-threaded IPC. We're talking encoding, rendering, encryption, scientific analysis, and so on. Other important details to mention are that the 2990WX costs $1799, while the 16-core 2950X also tested here is going to be selling for $899. At those prices, AMD is being seriously aggressive here. Maybe the company should have charged more, or maybe it's simply doing us a favor by recalibrating the market, bringing us to where it should have been years ago. Again, if you want more detailed information here, and benchmarks not covered in this video, you should hit up the article version on the website, as it definitely covers more ground. But for now, let's dive right into the results so that I can start packing. To kick things off, we of course had to begin with some good, but strange results. Clearly, AMD's 32-core wonder does very well in video encoding, but not always. Defying simple logic, the 32-core chip fell to the back of the pack in the TechAge video test, which is an encode of one of our previous videos. Considering the fact that the 2950X and other Ryzen perform much better in this test, it's safe to say that the threads and architecture as a whole are not being used effectively enough. Things fare a lot better when the GPU gets involved. With the graphics support, every encode time dramatically drops, and while the 2990 still falls back in that particular TechAge project, it leads the pack with the straight encodes. Magix Vegas is an application that's a recent entrant to our suite, having debuted a few weeks ago as a GPU test. Like Premiere Pro, Vegas also uses the CPU to good effect, so for a test here, I ran run of our projects through a CPU-focused AVC encoder, converting 4K60 to 1080p60. The 2990 continues to exercise its muscle pretty well, but based on the difference between the 16 and 32 core chips, it does seem like more optimization could take place. But it could also be that different projects would give more interesting results. While I haven't talked much about it up to this point, the 2950 is delivering very strong performance as well, consistently edging it ahead of the 1950 it's replacing. DaVinci is an application that's been recommended to us for testing a few times, and coincidentally, a brand new version is on its way, and since it's in beta, we were able to test it out for this review. I'm ridiculously inexperienced with this application, so the project here is a simple 4K60 video converted to a QuickTime YouTube upload using default settings. For good measure, an anti-camera shake effect is added. Clearly, the CPU is only relied upon for so much with DaVinci, or at least this particular project. Resolve is best known as a GPU encoding suite, so it'll probably be better suited for future workstation GPU content. What you as an end user needs to know though, is that the application can definitely take advantage of more than 10 cores. Just not much more than that, at least in our case. Photoscan is a powerful application that allows you to generate detailed 3D models from a set of photos taken of an object in many different angles. In our particular benchmark, 80 or so images of Apollo product packaging was used. As you can see by the images here, the results are very impressive, and can only become more impressive when you increase the intensity of the process. Photoscan takes great advantage of big CPUs, but for whatever reason, it behaves better with SMT disabled on both AMD and Intel. Intel fares better with SMT on, but on the 2990 in particular, it should definitely be turned off. It could be that in time, the application will take better advantage of the Mammoth chip, since other scenarios show that it can be done. I've provided Agisoft with detailed information about this, so here's the hoping an update tackling the issue is in our future. Now, it's time to move on to renderers, which we have many more tests for than we did with encoding. We'll start with one of the best named renderers ever, Arnold. Solid Angles renderer has become a very popular one over the years, and it's pretty de facto in certain design suites, some of which ship it by default, like 3ds Max and Maya. If you need proof that it's a good renderer, the fact that it's been used in movies like The Avengers and Pacific Rim should do the trick. We're off to a good start here. 
Since the projects I used were free scenes I found online, they may not be the most representative of more complex projects, but I think the point of scalability gets across. AMD's 32-core wonder dominates in both renders here. The 2950 continues to deliver just a bit more performance than its older brother. With Arnold, both tested projects showed a 15-second delta between them on the 2990, but with Blender, an even greater lead can be seen in the BMW scene. What's a little funny about that is just how simple in design that project is in comparison to Agent 327, which was designed specifically to show off what Blender can do. Big or small, the projects will scale extremely well on beefier CPUs. Keyshot is one of the coolest rendering applications I've ever touched, as you can hopefully understand from this footage of it in action. Keyshot lets you render your project with real-time iterations, with each move of the camera resetting the rendering process. This makes it easy to get better angles and inspect detail up close. It only looks as smooth as it does because of the 32 cores the 2990 offers, something the task manager in the corner helps prove. That all said, we do have some odd results with some chips here. The Porsche model rendered pretty much as expected straight up the stack, but the interior render, which has many reflective surfaces, didn't render as well on the 2990. Again, this is a hint that optimizations of the software could be made to take better advantage of these chips. This is highlighted by the fact that it isn't an SMT issue, since the 16-core chips with SMT are faster than the 32-core 2990. For some unfortunate reason, AMD's own Radeon Pro render doesn't scale too well with the new 32-core chip. I have tested multiple beta versions of the plugin and nothing has changed. I'm not sure at this point if the issue is related to the Maya version of the plugin or the projects I'm using, but it's unfortunate. Of all the renderers I expected to scale brilliantly on the 2990, it was this one. Again, this highlights the need for optimization. I took a look at Chaos Group's V-Ray GPU Next renderer a few months ago, so it was nice to be able to test out the CPU version for this review, since it's typically what most people will use for their final production renders. Interestingly, V-Ray is the first renderer to not show much of a strength on the 2990, which is a bit of a shame as I was hoping for a lot more. What's strange about this is that with the standalone benchmark, seen here, the gap has widened far more than it was in the real world. I'm not sure for the reason of this discrepancy, but I hope to be able to chat to Chaos Group about it at SIGGRAPH. Corona Renderer is one I'm not very familiar with, but given the strengthening that was being done to our test suite, I had to give it a shot. And it turns out to be very impressive, generating gorgeous results very quickly. For testing here, I plugged Corona into 3D Max, and the results are once again kind to AMD, putting the 2990 cleanly at the top. The 8700K might sit a fair bit behind the 2700X, but if the 9700K rumor proves true, we'll see some interesting shakeups here. At AMD's second-gen Ryzen Threadripper event held in Modena, Italy a couple of weeks ago, the company had some demo PCs showing off what the new chip could do. I ended up being intrigued by an application I'd never seen before, one that turned out to be Adobe Dimension. And it's a really cool piece of software, essentially allowing people to take real-world photos and add realistic 3D objects to the scene. As you can probably guess without much effort, this application didn't agree with me much. The project I chose for benchmarking doesn't open on the 2990 when SMT is left enabled, so that's the reason for it being disabled here. Adobe is very aware of this issue, and it will be rectified in the future. Nonetheless, AMD provided an entirely different project that does open up just fine, so that explains the orange results. Clearly, when SMT is used, actually substantial gains can be seen. In my look at AMD's and Intel's 16-core processors a few weeks ago, I mentioned that testing Cinebench at this point in time seems pointless, as it was four generations out of date. Coincidentally, Maxon has just announced Cinema 4D R20, making Cinebench now five generations out of date. I hope the company decides to turn R20 into a benchmark, but even if it doesn't, C4D has become a static part of our suite. There are absolutely no surprises with these first results. During the press event in Modena, AMD had overclockers on hand to push the 2990 with liquid nitrogen, and before long, a world record was broken, 7600 points. That's an impressive number, but even at stock speeds, the 2990WX breaks the 5000 mark, which is quite something considering the 7980XE sits at 3400. One great thing about Cinebench is that it also gauges single-threaded performance, and that gives us just about what we'd expect to see. Intel Superfast 8700K sits comfortably at the top, with all of the CPUs below it largely being ranked by our expectations of each chip's IPC. The 1950X is an odd result at the bottom though, as I had definitely expected the 2990 to be there. This is consistent with Pavre, which I left the results for in the article, for time's sake. In real-world tests, Cinema 4D emulates V-Ray to a certain extent, in that real-world performance doesn't align with the synthetic testing, but the gains are much more favorable to the 2990 here than they were in V-Ray. Here, AMD clearly dominates. If only Intel had that 28-core Core i9 shown off at Computex here today, we'd really see some interesting results. 
I had thought about leaving all of the Linux benchmarks in the article version, but some of them are important enough to be included here, such as with software compiling, which you can see going on in the background. As expected, AMD's 32 cores helped it reach the top of the chart here, though Intel gives the chip a real run for its money with the ImageMagick compile. The kernel compiling in nearly 30 seconds really makes me want to haul out my overclocking hat. As I found out the hard way during testing, Handbrake 1.1.1 does not love AMD too much, as the encode times were much worse than Intel's with that version. After investigation, it turns out that 1.1.1 somehow introduced a change that dramatically impacted AMD performance. To give an example, the 265 encode took more than twice as long to encode with 1.1.1 as it does in 1.1.0. Meanwhile, performance on Intel between the two versions is basically the same. That all said, Intel dominates this test, which is not at all unusual for multimedia scenarios. Still, considering the large delta between the 2990 and 2950, it seems this application could do a better job of using all available threads. Continuing its reign at the top, the 2990 pushes well ahead of the competition in the encryption test, one that's normally dominated by Intel, as you can see by how far ahead the 7960 is ahead of the 2950. These Rodinia tests represent some of the most grueling calculations, so it's a true torture test, and one that fared well for AMD. The 2990 performed well in the solver test, but that's almost easy to ignore with the kinds of gains seen in the Lava MD one. It's not going to be difficult summing this one up. Without question, AMD is offering an unbelievably powerful chip with the Ryzen Threadripper 2990WX. I'm still surprised that it even exists, to be completely honest. Now, while I've talked lots about core counts, in actuality, it's not the core counts that really matter at the end of the day. You probably don't buy your Radeons and G-Forces based on their core counts. What you actually want is the overall performance. The same principle should be applied here. Again, it's not going to be ideal for everyone. If you want the snappiest PC possible, especially for gaming, you want fewer cores and higher IPC. For serious work, you want as many cores as you can pile on. If you use Arnold, for example, you stand to see incredible gains in performance with a chip like the 2990WX. The same could be said for pretty much every other renderer tested. Having tested the 16 and 18 core chips before this, I felt like I was really quite prepared for this performance look, but admittedly, I was throwing some curveballs. You can't just double the cores and expect every bit of software to pretend like it doesn't notice. Handbrake and Linux use literally half of the CPU, as one example. Then there are applications like Photoscan which did not use AMD's many core chips too well, or Intel for that matter, since SMT off proved better for both of them. Even with as many graphs as there were here, it's hard to wrap this up and feel like I covered enough ground. Again, if you want more detailed information, including some light gaming tests, I'd recommend hitting up the written version on the website. Before wrapping up here, I know I didn't touch on the 2950X as much as I should have, but I feel like we honestly knew what to expect from that to begin with, especially given the second gen Ryzen series, and also what we knew from the 1950X which we just performance tested a few weeks ago. Fortunately, the 2950X was in fact faster than the 1950X in every test, sometimes by a greater margin than I expected. A nice iteration, but of course not a reason to jump up from the 1950X. For those looking to build a new rig and are tempted by a 16 core processor priced at $899, it's a value packed option. And with that, thanks as always for watching and please subscribe if you haven't done so already as there's a lot more of this content coming.